Do you ever notice how many songs there are in the world about love? Think about it. Most of the songs we hear have something to do with love. We hear about the one who's all out of love, who's lost in love, who can't find love, who still believes in love, who gave up on love, who found love on a one-way street, all over, you name it. There are so many songs about love. And if it's not enough that our songs are immersed with love, it's in our books and our movies and uh, poems and literature of every imaginable sort. With all of the discussion about love that we do in our society, you would think that we would be masters at the art by now because there's nothing about love we haven't discussed ad nauseum. But all you have to do is look around at the world around us to realize that we're not perfect at love, that there's a lot of room for growth. It's not to be pessimistic. You know, there are a lot of good, wonderful, loving things out there. There's a lot of reason for hope, but we all realize that we have room to grow and that our world is not the perfectly loving place that it should be. And one of the reasons for that, I feel, is that we tend to do an awful lot of talking about love and not really a lot of loving. We tell other people that they need to love us, that they need to be more loving towards others, but we fail in that way in ourselves, in being the love that we claim that we should be to others. And we confuse so many things for love. You know, we use that word so flippantly. We talk about love in a variety of ways. And in English, we have a handicap because we have only one word for it, love. And we use the same word to say, I love French fries and I love God. Greek has three different words for it, eros, philia, and agape. Eros is the type of love from which we take the word erotic, and we all know what that means. Philia is the love of appreciation, that we, we appreciate something. So, for example, somebody who is a Francophile loves and appreciates everything French. And then there's the word agape, and that's the word for love that Jesus used all the time. And what he uses in the gospel reading today, love one another as I have loved you. Agape is a total gift of oneself to another. In Hebrew and in Aramaic, the word would be the same, what Jesus actually spoke every day. Hebrew actually has 27 different words for love. Don't worry, I'm not going to explain all 27 to you. But agape in Greek, in Hebrew, was the highest form of love, and that is hesed, total covenantal love, an absolute solemn binding promise of love of one to another to the point of total gift of oneself to the other. And that's the love that Jesus told us to have one another, for love one another. Hesed one another, as I have hesed, if that's the word in English, the form of it, you. Show a total and complete covenantal love to another, a total gift of self where you're willing to pour out everything you have for the well-being of the other, just as I did for you. If we want to see the perfect example of love, we're staring at it. Look at our crucifix, that Jesus loved us enough to take our sins upon himself and the price for the sins that we should have paid. He says, no, I won't make you do that. I will do it for you. I will bear the sufferings for your sins, for your guilt. I will take all that pain upon myself so that you will be freed from them because I know you can't do that for yourself. I will do it, and I ask you now just to love me and love one another in return with that very same love. To love one another, to love the other person as other. In other words, to will the well-being of the other person just because that person exists and because we want them to be the best they can be. We want them to be what God has created them to be. And if we see them in a situation where they're not living out their full potential, well, we want to tell them that. We want to bring them to that love. And sometimes that love means a sacrifice from us. It's not always easy. You know, sometimes we point out so many things we think are love. For example, we may see somebody who is very generous with their time or especially their money to a charity or a family member or something like that. And we might say, oh, look how generous, look how loving they are. But if we look at this situation, we may realize that that particular individual isn't loving at all. In fact, when that person gives to somebody else, they may give a lot of money, 
or a lot of time, but there are a lot of strings attached to that. And there's a lot they expect the other person to do in return for that love. And so therefore, that person is not loving, but they're trying to bind that person into an obligation to them, to basically make them slaves to them by all those strings that they can pull like a puppeteer moving a marionette. And so they can manipulate the other person to do their bidding. And that is not love. You notice Jesus never did that with us. He never once tried to manipulate people to do what he wanted them to do. Never gave them a a guilt trip. Never tried to remind them always of just remember what you did and I let you off the hook or anything like that. He gave and gave and gave of himself until there was nothing left for him to give. And when it would have seemed to the world that he'd given everything he had to give, when he hung dead upon the cross, there was one thing left that he could still claim was his own, and that was his body, even hanging there dead on the cross. Yet even that, the night before he died, he'd given to us as our food in the Eucharist. So when Jesus died on the cross, he'd given everything, a total and exhaustive outpouring of love to all of us. That's hesed, that's agape, that's what it means to love, to give until it hurts. And believe me, Jesus did give until it hurt. That death for him on the cross was very painful. And we are called to do the same, to give to others, even to the point of inconvenience, and especially to the point of pain for us. And even if the other person doesn't appreciate what we're doing for them, to give and to give because it's the right thing to do, because we love the other person, whether they like us for it, whether they appreciate it, and even if they don't appreciate it for us, even if they dislike it, to be willing to give of ourselves completely to somebody else. Parents do it naturally all the time for their children, especially think of a parent with an infant. That infant is not alert. That infant cannot turn to the mother and father and say, Mommy, Daddy, thank you for what you're doing for me. In fact, that infant is causing them a lot of lost sleep because they cry and need to be fed in the middle of the night or have their diaper changed. And there's so many things they can't do in their life because now they have a child and they're not as free as they used to be. And that child can't return anything in love to that parent. Yet the parent gives and gives and gives to that child and they would lay down their life for that child. That is true love. We see it at the other end of life when a spouse maybe is in an advanced illness. Imagine, for example, a woman who is in a nursing home with advanced Alzheimer's, maybe even in a coma or something like that. And the husband goes and sits with her every day and brushes her hair and embraces her, caresses her hand and just sits and speaks to her hoping maybe she can even hear him. She can't respond. She can't say thank you to him. He's not getting anything from her in return for what he's giving, but he gives and he goes every day because he loves her. That is a total gift of self. And that is what you and I are called to give to one another. As Jesus says, love one another as I have loved you. And sometimes that love can be very hard for us to give even to people that we love because we know it's not always easy to love one another. Think of um, a parent, for example, who has a grown child with an addiction and they have to practice tough love because the child just does not realize how sick they are in denial that they have a drug or alcohol problem. And so the parent has to throw them out and make them fall before they'll pick themselves up. And it's a painful thing for the parent to see the child have to go through that. But they hardly would love the child if they just enabled the kid, gave the kid all the money they wanted to still go out and buy drugs and just ignored that there was anything wrong. Of course not. That would be negligent on their point. They would be feeding his illness rather than helping him. So a parent, probably with a lot of pain in their heart and maybe tears in their eyes, has to practice tough love with their child so that the child will hopefully turn around and realize he's harming himself. And so anybody who gives us a love that's merely nice and comforting, you know, sometimes we get the idea that love is just hugging one another and telling each other we feel good and, you know, uh, I love you, you love me, I'm okay, you're okay. And there's nothing particularly wrong with that. But it's not complete love. Just telling each other we love each other and let's be a big family, you know, that's nice and that's sweet. But that's Barney. And somehow I think God himself took on flesh to dwell in our world and teach us more than we can learn from a purple dinosaur. 
If Barney is the fullness of truth, what do we need Jesus for? Obviously, the Lord's love is a lot more than just be kind to one another and say niceties, say nice words to each other. Priests sometimes can be uh, like anybody who has any degree of fame. Uh, politicians, rock stars, Hollywood actors and actresses, ac- athletes, you name it. They get, we get our own groupies, devotees, whatever you want to call them, people that follow around us and support us, and nothing you say is wrong. Father is wonderful. Everything Father says is perfect. And I could poop on the rug, and they'd say to me, oh, but Father, that's the most beautiful poop I've ever seen. You know, and people like that can be a help to us. I'm not saying we don't appreciate having them, especially if you're really having a difficult time and somebody comes to pick you up. And it's nice to know that there are people there supporting you. But you know what? Those are not the ones who help me be the best priest I can be. The people who really help me be my best are people who are willing to tell me the truth, not just to praise me if I've done something well, but to point out to me if I've made a mistake, if I'm holding back, if I'm not following the Lord to the best of my ability, if I'm not doing everything I should be doing. Those are the people who lovingly tell me the truth about myself that help me be the best I can be. And I want those people in my life. My parents have always been that way with me. They'll be the first ones to praise me if I do something right and to celebrate with me. They'll also be honest with me if they they think I'm being wrong or being pigheaded on something. They'll be the first to tell me so. My best friend, the same thing. My spiritual director will tell me if I'm right or if he thinks I'm being stubborn. And I want people in my life that will tell me the truth about myself, even if it's painful to hear. Sure, I want them to tell me charitably. I don't want them to blast me with with double-barreled guns. But when they tell me something, even if it hurts to hear it, I try to think about it and say, you know, I know they love me and they have my best interests at heart. I may not always agree with them. What they see as a criticism, I might say, no, I'm sorry, I am still just being faithful to the Lord in this. But at least I know they have my well-being at heart and they love me. And that's why they're not afraid to come and tell me that, even if I might get angry with them. I remember specifically one person who did that for me in my life when I was just a boy. When I was a child in the early childhood ages, you know, the first first couple of grades, primary years, I was a little shrimp of a kid. I always looked about three or four years younger than in fact I was, and I was a tiny little kid with a mouth and a personality bigger than his body, and I always loved to be the center of attention at family gatherings in school, always telling jokes and things like that and drawing attention to myself. And in the early days, everybody thought I was so adorable and so cute. And when my parents went to parent-teacher conferences, it was always the same thing. Oh, he's so lovable, he's so adorable, he's so cute, he's so smart, he's so this, he's so that, we love him, blah, blah, blah. And so year after year, that's what I heard from teachers, and, um, and nothing ever changed until I was in sixth grade. And when I entered sixth grade, we had a new teacher in the school, Sister Susan. Sister Susan, of course, had never seen me before that. She was brand new to our school. And in the beginning, I liked Sister Susan. She seemed to like me. And the day came that my parents had to go for parent-teacher conferences. And so I wasn't worried in the least. I figured I'm just going to get another one of these wonderful, your son is great little reports. Well, when my parents came back and gave me the report of what Sister Susan said, it felt like they punched me right in the stomach. And it was a gut-wrenching blow what they had to tell me. Sister Susan did not talk about how wonderful and how cute and how adorable I was. Rather, she said quite the opposite. She said he's disruptive of class, he's always cracking jokes, he's always trying to be the center of attention, he doesn't give the other kids a chance, and he tries to be cute. And it may have worked when he was younger, but he's getting too old to be cute, and it's time for him to change and start maturing. And my parents told me that, and you know what? I didn't want to hear it at the first glance. In fact, I remember it reduced me to tears. I did not want to hear that I had a lot of growing and a lot of changing to do. But as I thought it through and I got through my tears, I realized that Sister Susan was right, that she cared about me. I always knew she did. And so I started praying about it and said, all right, well then, Lord, help me change and be different. And I remember sometime down the line, Sister Susan said to me one point, she goes, you know, I'm seeing a lot of changes in you for the better. Keep it up. And from that moment on, with that encouragement, I was on the fast track to trying to mature and being what I needed to be. 
many years later, when I was in the seminary, we had an activity one day where they asked us to think back on all the people in our life who had led us to that part in our vocation, people who had helped us know the Lord, be the best we could be. And in that activity, one name that kept coming to my mind was Sister Susan. I hadn't seen her for many years because she only stayed in our school for three years. After I graduated eighth grade, she was transferred to another school, and I had not seen her since. But I tracked her down, found out where she was teaching then, and asked to meet with her and had lunch with her. And I sat her down and told her all about the activity we were doing. I said, when I think of people who made a difference in my life, who brought me to this point, you are one of the people that came to mind that what you did for me in the sixth grade. And I told her specifically about that, what she told my parents on that parent-teacher night. And she kind of squirmed in her chair a little, and she says, oh, I hope I wasn't too harsh on you. I said, well, I have to tell you in honesty, it was painful when I heard it, but I'm glad that you did because you told me the truth at the time I needed it, and you were not afraid to hurt me because you knew I would be better for it in the long run. And I realized afterwards that Sister took a great gamble in that. First of all, I'm sure she prayed beforehand, before giving that to my parents. And she didn't really know my parents very well. She didn't know how they would respond. They could have been the type of parents that would have said, how dare you say that about my son? My son is a perfect child. I want you to take that back and complain to the principal that she was picking on my kid, as sadly some parents do. So she had to take the risk that my parents might turn on her, which thankfully they didn't. They listened to her. She also took the risk that I may not appreciate that, that I might be so hurt and angry that she said that, that I would never listen to her again, and that I would just continue to be disruptive in class, and I wouldn't listen to anything. And of course, thankfully, that didn't happen. She took a great risk. She was willing to put her own popularity on the line, that I wouldn't like her anymore, just so that I would hear the truth from her. And people who truly love that, uh, love us are willing to do that, not just saying what we want to hear so that we'll be popular with them. In fact, somebody who does that just tells people what they want to hear. Well, they're not helping that person at all because they're not challenging them to be better. And all of us have ways to grow. None of us is perfect. And if we think the life we're living right now is absolutely perfect in the Lord, we're greatly deluded. And the people who love us are the ones who love us enough to tell us the truth, even if that truth means we're going to have to change a lot in our lives, even if that truth is going to be painful for us to hear, even if that truth means we're not going to like them very much. And so to love one another as I have loved you means to put our life totally at the service of another, never thinking about what I'm getting about it, but are these people better? for what I'm going to do, to love other people, even perfect strangers or people we know very little about, to want them to be the best they can be because God wants them to be the best they can be, and to love them as other and wanting them to know everything Jesus wants of them. And so sometimes people might say to me, you know, Father, all you need is love. Well, If they say that to me, my response to them is, I agree with you 100%. All you need is love. Yes, that is absolutely true. But the question I have to ask is, what do you mean by love when you say all all you need is love? If you mean just giving each other a nice big hug and saying niceties to each other and pretending there's nothing wrong with everyone and we're all wonderful, no. I will never accept that as all you need is niceties. But if we say to the other, all you need is to give yourself in a total and exhaustive agape hesed outpouring of love where we desire only the well-being of the other person, regardless of what it costs me, regardless of your opinion of me, that I'm going to, willing, that I'm going to willingly take pain and suffering upon myself so that you will be a better person, even if you hate me for it, but it will bring you closer to Christ. Yes, indeed then all you need is love. May Jesus Christ be praised now and forever.